The new year, the end of one year and going into another at midnight tonight, always brings some of us to year-end plans and schedules and goals. I know for Lynn and I, we always, at her initiative, because she's far more organized than I am, but her initiative, we always take some time to review our budget, see where money went last year, where it should go this year, and we take our ties, we see who we gave to last year and whether we should add or delete accordingly. And we make plans for the year and things like that. And I'm sure a lot of you are the same way. I don't believe in New Year's resolutions because I don't think you keep them after three weeks anyways. But this morning, I don't want to talk so much just about 2024. I want to talk about the rest of our life. I've titled my message this morning, Three Musts for a New Year. We're going to take a look at a portion of scripture in Luke chapter 9. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to that. We'll read it in just a few minutes after my introductory comments. But the end of a year brings reflection on the past year, but it's also a reflection for where we're headed. And sometimes it can be very sobering. Very sobering. And as I got thinking and preparing for this message, I thought, let me do something different so that we can understand a perspective that hits home to our hearts. I went onto the computer and I found that the average life expectancy in the United States in 2022 was 79.05 years. So I thought, I'm not going to be unrealistic and choose 100. I'm going to use 80. And so if we look at that, if we've lived 25% of those 80 years, we have 60 years left, supposedly, to live. If we've lived 50% of those years, we have 40 years left. And if we've lived 75% of those years, we have 20 years left. Now, those of you that have hit 80 or 90, I don't want you this morning to think, well, I've reached the goal, and now I can just coast. <laughs> but my question this morning for all of us is, how are you going to plan out or schedule the rest of your unlived lifespan? At the end of your life, who will people remember you as? In our portion of scripture this morning, which we'll come to in a minute, Jesus said, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that you are? As you come to the end of your life, who are people going to say that you are? Not how good you were or what you've done what impact are you going to live on the lives of people? I know an awful lot of Christians, and this morning I'm going to direct my attention to Christians. That they reach an age in life and they go, I've been there, done that, I can just... Exactly what they do. And they have no impact, zero impact in the lives of other people. Jesus has a lot to say about how we're to live our entire lifespan. Lord, how can I make the most of the time left in my life? How can I best be a blessing to someone in my life? Is it possible to be able to minister to others around me in some beneficial, honoring, practical, tangible, spiritually life-impacting way. There are some men, 
My father was one of them. They just wanted to die in the pulpit. My dad's last trip to the Dominican Republic was at the age of 95 when he preached 30 times. And he went into the nursing home. And it was only within the last six months that his mind started to deteriorate. As 2024 begins, we have no more time to claim than anyone else around us, regardless of their age. We have no time to reclaim in this life other than what God has ordained for us. God has our days numbered on this earth. In Job chapter 14, verse 5, it says that man's days are determined. You have decreed the number of months and have set limits he cannot exceed. When the Lord says it's time to go home, it's time to go home. How can I best invest my time this day, this week, this year and the years left in my life remaining for his glory. Let's go to our passage of scripture this morning. And in these short verses, we're going to see some very impactful things that Jesus lays out. Luke chapter 9, verse 18. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? Notice he didn't ask, what do they think of me? What do they think of my miracles? What do they think of my teaching? He says, who do they say that I am? And they replied, well, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others still say one of the prophets of long ago that has come back to life. And then he looks right at them and he says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And right away, Peter, always the outspoken one, he doesn't wait for anybody else. And for once he gets it right. He says, the Christ of God. In Mark and Matthew, they have slightly different uh, additions to this very story. And there he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. But the Christ of God. Peter nails it but not for very long. Verse 21, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. You see, shortly after Peter said the Christ of God, Jesus tells him about his suffering. He must go and confront all of these people and be killed on the third day, or be killed and on the third day be raised to life. You know what Peter said? Never. This will not happen to you. He blew it. And what does Jesus say to him? Get thee behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You are a stumbling block because you don't have the mind of God but the mind of others. You do not understand, Peter. I must go. You're still not getting it. He nailed who, Peter, who Jesus was, but he did not understand that Jesus had to complete his journey on this earth. And then Jesus strictly warns them not to tell this to anyone. 
Why would that be? Here's why. You see, the disciples had been so preoccupied as to which one of them was going to be the greatest. Which one could maybe sit on the right and the other one on the left in his kingdom? Jesus has just finished feeding the 5,000. They've seen one of his miracles. They've been with him for three years. And they were so concerned that they might dream of the day when Jesus would be king and they would be one of his nobles in his kingdom. Jesus is preparing the disciples to be the leader posts of the church in the first century. They had a long way to go to understand this. They had come from fishing and carpentry and tax collector, whatever it was. They weren't learned men. And Jesus says, I don't want you to warn anybody because you still don't get it. You don't understand yet. One day you will. But right now, I want you to keep it quiet. Because Jesus was coming as prophet, priest, and king. He was coming as prophet to declare the truth and reveal himself to mankind. He would be coming as priest to provide perfect redemption. And he was coming as king to rule in absoluteness. And they had no way of being able to explain that to the people before the cross. The cross was the epic of the journey. And without the cross, they would never understand the Messiahship. So he says, keep it quiet for now. Well, he unfolds what he must go through. And in verse 22 is what we call the first passion predicament. And then what follows in verse 23 is a lifetime assignment, not only to the disciples, but to every follower of Jesus Christ, where he says this. And then he said to them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. He must take up his cross daily, and he must follow me. This is the first time that Luke uses the word cross. <clears throat> and when Jesus is lying, laying out before his disciples his journey to his death, you can imagine what it would be like if you, at his age, gathered your family around you and sat them down and began to explain the form of your death and the time of your death. Can you imagine how you would receive that? Put yourself in the disciples' shoes. This absolutely gripped them. They were going to be left as orphans. That's why Jesus in John 15, 14 said, Do not let your heart be troubled. I'm coming back. And the word cross to them at that time would have not only been painful to them, but it would have been repulsive and repugnant. Because today we don't have the mental image of this word cross as they would have had in the first century. You see, in the first century, the cross would never, ever, ever have been embellished. It was an implement of death of the worst kind imaginable. It was a sign of inhumane suffering only reserved for criminals of the worst kind. Cruelest form of death. It was scornful. It was despicable. It was unreserved form of torture to an individual. It was the highest degree of disgrace and shame that could be done to a man and it proclaimed him under the curse. The disciples would not have been able to handle that word cross. 
You see, today, we see crosses embellished all over the place. We see crosses embellished on necklaces. We see them in churches, inside the church and outside the church. We have crosses in the form of tattoos on bodies. We have them as bumper stickers. We have them in the covers of Bibles. You can imagine today how we would view that if it was that of a lethal injection or a hangman's noose or a firing squad or any form of capital punishment and we would never embellish such a thing. That's what it was like in his day. Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, Cursed is he who hangs on a cross. Mark Moore wrote a commentary called The Chronological Life of Christ. He also wrote a sequel called From Glory to Galilee. And in it, he says this, and I quote, In the Roman culture, no one would ever be so crass as to turn a cross into a trinket to be worn around your neck or hung from the mirror of your car. It was an instrument of excruciating torture and death. Everyone who picked up a cross embarked on a one-way journey from which he would never return. We have a perfect example of that in John chapter 19 where Jesus had to carry his own cross for at least part of the way to Calvary until he would have collapsed and then Simon of Cyrene would have come along and probably taken it the rest of the way. A one-way journey to the death. We notice too, he says, that crucifixion was the Roman mode of execution, not the Jewish mode, which would have been stoning. Thus, Jesus' words are prophetic and personal. End of quote. And the same way as they would have seen it back then is the same way we'll see it today in verse 23. There's three things that I want <clears throat> us to see here in this verse. I want us to look at the words all and everyone because they apply to you and to me. Put your name there, personally. If George wants to come after me, that's the condition. If any one of you, put your name there, want to come after me. You see, I know you know the Savior. The conversion is taken care of, that's salvation. This is not salvation. This is a sanctification act that becomes a daily assignment as we're going to see in a few minutes. Number two, these are choices of Christ's followers. It's if we wish to come after him. You may choose not to. That's your decision. We know of many people in the ministry who have decided not to follow and instead have become casual and corrupt and scandalous and have hurt the cause of Christ more than you can imagine. And because of it, they have grieved the very heart of God. They decided to follow for a while and they decided not to. They have made a conscious decision to quit as his followers. Thirdly, notice that all three musts are imperative. There are three commands. Do you know what's interesting to me? Jesus never uses suggestions in the Bible. There are always commands. Well, you know, I would suggest that if you desire to do this, then you might... Think of doing that. It doesn't work that way with the Lord. Once we decide to follow him, 
We've given our heart to him. We have to follow his plan. There's no alternative. All three are commands. You must, you must, and you must. There's no requirements as being Jewish or good looking. Being rich, being successful, being well educated, having gone to seminary. None of those things. Let's take a look at the first must this morning. You must deny yourself. Now hang here for a moment and take a deep breath. Because if denying throws you, just think of this. It means say no to. Very simple. To deny is to say no to. It goes against everything in our being to do that, humanly speaking. It includes a refusal to set one's will or desires against the will of his master. It says that I must relinquish my plans, my desires, my preferences, my pleasures, my dreams, my reputation. Instead, I acquiesce, I defer, I pursue, I commit myself to another's will. Simply, I say no to what I prefer. Let me allow myself to add four words. Narcissists need not apply. We're filled to the brim in our culture with narcissists, and day I say that most of them are in leadership not just in Christianity, but in the world. It's all about me, mine, and ours. Instead, we say that I deliberately put the Lord Jesus in first place in everything, every choice, every decision, so that he might have the preeminence in my life. That is impossible for a narcissist. He's the potter, I'm the clay. He's the master, and I'm the servant. And so Jesus here is telling his disciples that they must forsake their personal ambitions and desires in order to fill the will of God. That's why he called them by the lake shore and said, leave your nets and come and follow me and become followers of men, fishers of men. In short, it means that we must live for his sake and not our own. And we all know that that's easier said than done. But Jesus left us, I think, which is one of the greatest examples, and Carl preached on it last Sunday. He he brought out very well this example in John chapter 13. Jesus gets up from the feast of the Passover, and the meal is still being served. And he takes his outer coat out, throws it down, and he takes a towel and he girds himself. And the minute he did that, he became the model of a slave to serve his disciples. He denied himself of who he was. And he begins to wash the feet, and I believe that Peter was the first, because Peter says, Are you going to wash my feet? He says, yes. No. Again, no. That is not going to happen. And Jesus says, you do not understand now. And then after Jesus starts to wash his feet, well, not my feet only, my whole body. He still didn't get it. He's not getting the lesson. But then I like what it says here. In verse 1 of John 13, this is the key. He now showed them the full extent of his love. The full extent. 
by washing their feet. I have said, as Carl said, I love you. I'm not going to abandon you. I will come back for you. But I got to show you, I got to demonstrate to you the full extent of my life, love. And what a better way than to get down and gird himself with a towel and to wash their feet. Can you see King Charles doing that? Jesus took the place of a slave, the lowest possible service in that time. Then he goes on to say, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. You need to deny yourselves for the cause of other people. And the very next verse, he says, now that you have learned this, blessed are you if you do it. Jerry, this morning in his devotional, talked about Philippians 2 that I've shown here as well. He made himself nothing or of no reputation. Being equal with God, considered it not equality. He took the form of a servant. He humbled himself and became obedient unto the death. That's the epitome of denying yourself. And the disciples would continue to struggle living this out for the rest of their life. And they would continually be reminded to deny themselves. Denying ourselves is a requirement, Jesus says, to follow him. Why? Because we can't serve two masters. It's got to be one or the other. It's all or nothing. The second must that we see here this morning is you must take up your cross daily. Jesus builds upon the denying ourselves, but what does it really mean to take up your cross? Well, you might say I can take my cross up monthly, maybe weekly sometimes. Oh, even better for Easter. That's when it really counts. I have a neighbor who's Catholic. She goes to church twice a year, Christmas and Easter, to get herself right. That's what it means to some, to many, most in the world. But some people quote this verse to point to some burden that they must carry in their life. To some people, bearing their cross is their spouse. That's the cross I have to bear, they say. Or their job, a sour boss, illness, doing without. That's their idea. That's many Christians' idea of burying your cross. It's like a demanding, thankless job or a broken relationship, a challenging situation. This is not what Jesus meant. That is self-pride and pity. What Jesus is talking about is the level to which we are to deny ourselves. To take up our cross is something that has to take place in our thoughts, in our heart, and in our body to put them to death on an inner cross. That's why Paul said, do you not know that your body is the Holy Spirit? I once heard a, a message from Charles Wendell addressing the graduating students of Dallas Theological Seminary. He was preparing them for getting out in the ministries and the things that they were going to come up against. And I've never heard him, anybody, preach like this when he said to them, one of the main requirements of how you are going to minister effectively for the Lord is how you take care of your body physically 
And that includes your weight and your dress. Whoa. Now, I dress like this simply because this is how I was raised. That's just me. I respect where I am. I've never heard it preached on. But boy, did he ever t tell that graduating class. If you want to glorify God in the ministry, take care of your body. Look after yourself. That's part of taking up the cross for Christ. As these thoughts come to our minds, whatever they may be, those worldly thoughts, desires, we need to choose to deny them. Our mind stands the guard at the door of our heart. And you and you and you alone get to decide what comes through. Where's the filter? Living for Christ means that we miss, must pick up our cross daily and die to ourselves. It's not always going to be pleasant. Many times it's going to be painful. But this is the way to life that Jesus promised us. It's not only when we give up, but crucify our own desires and our old self. And it's only after we can pick up our cross that we can find the fullness of life. The third must is that we must follow him. Now the first two imperatives are in what we call the aorist tense. That's the past tense. We've denied ourselves. We've made a conscious decision to take up our cross daily. But now we have to decide, and it's a command in the present tense, keep on following. You keep on following. You keep on following. You keep on following. You keep on following day and night whether things are good or bad. You keep on following whether things are hot or cold. You keep on following whether you're sick or well. Case in point, Ray is here this morning. Following Jesus Christ involves three things. I've listed them here for you. It is not just a matter of believing in him. It is obeying him. The question we can all ask ourselves this morning, every single one of us, is there an area of our life or your life that is in disobedience to God this morning? Only you know what that is. But let me encourage you, let me challenge you. If there's an area of disobedience that you, what we would call a little sin, but if there's an area of disobedience in your life today that is impeding you from following him, you must deal with it. If you're truly serious of being faithful followers of Christ, you must deal with that area of disobedience. Number two, Obeying him means more than accepting the truth. It means tasting death. It means tasting death of a dream, perhaps a project, perhaps a mission, perhaps a hope, perhaps a plan. And any one of those can be a very good thing in your mind. But if God is telling you, not to, to bury it because he has something better for you. That's what it entails. And number three, tasting death is more than an occasional unselfish act. It is dying to something every day. That's what it means when it says, take up your cross daily. We're going to come across situations every single day, 
whether it's in the grocery store or whether it's at work or wherever it may be. Last week, the week before Christmas, Jaron and I were painting in a house in um, Thwassen. The lady wanted a bunch of work done in several rooms of the house. She had company coming on the Friday before Christmas. That would have been about the 22nd in there. We had until the day before to get it all done, and she had added on to the contract. And so we busily went at it. And there was just one area left on the Friday morning to go back <coughs> and touch up to be finished. When we arrived at the house, she was beside herself. Her electrician came in after we finished on the Thursday and put in all the pot lots, pot lights. He cut the holes a bit too big. He had fingerprints all over our freshly painted ceiling. She was about to die. She had company coming. Jaron stayed until midnight of the Friday to put it right. Had to call the drywaller back in that we work with quite often. She whipped out that check so fast to pay him, you wouldn't believe it. She says, I can't believe that you will go to this extent to fix up somebody else's problem to make me happy. On Tuesday, this last Tuesday, they were scheduled to go to Vancouver Island as a family to meet with other family over Vancouver Island. And her dog sitter <clears throat> bailed on her. What does she do? She picks up the phone. And she phones Jaron. She says, you're the only one I trust in my house. You proved yourself by what you did to bail us out. For three days, he's looking after the two dogs. See, sometimes we just have to take up a cross for the sake of the Lord to be a witness and a testimony. The world is looking at us. Let me just conclude with a couple of thoughts here. Now, this doesn't seem pleasant. And you might be wondering why you want to follow Christ when you have to deny yourself and take up a cross. Why would I want to follow him? Because I don't know what that's going to entail. But we cannot lose sight of the life that comes on after on the other side of that pain. The promise Jesus gives his followers who do this is the hope of a better future. Not just here and now, but in all of eternity. It's like the birth of a child, one of the most painful experiences a person, a woman can experience. So the question is, why do so many moms have multiple kids if the pain was so intense during giving birth for the first time? You think they learn. Who was it that said somebody had 18? Was it last Sunday? Charles Wesley, number 18. Number eight. I can't even imagine. <laughs> but they go through that because the life on the other side of giving birth is so wonderful, is so worth the price. My mind goes to Gloria Gaither's song that says, the because he lives, how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and the joy he gives. We're reaping, you know, you go through the teenage years and all the words. Now we are reaping the joy of our kids looking after us. Setting everything up in place from us, from decluttering the house to legally putting everything, our, you know, our daughters in the law business. And dad, have you thought of this? Dad, have, you know, you know, I just relish it. That's that's on the other side.
The life on the other side of that pain is so incredibly worth it. That's the promise of Jesus we hold on to. My final verse is this. I think, I think Paul nails it here in this verse. In Romans 8, 17 and 18, he says, Now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God, that's salvation. And joined heirs with Christ. What does that mean? That means that in Hebrews 1, it says that God the Father appointed Jesus as, as heir of all things. And because we are joined heirs with him, we are going to be a part of that inheritance. Joined heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that be, will be revealed in us. Let's take a hold of that thought right now. Life is painful. Jesus said it wouldn't be easy. That we would have tribulation. We're, we have to suffer for the cause of Christ if we are going to inherit and be joint heirs with Christ in the future. And what's on this side is not worth comparing to that which is going to be for all eternity. Paul said in Colossians 3.24 that we will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. And in 1 Peter 1, he says we have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for us. As we go into 2024, I'm going to go back to where I started. How are we going to plan out the rest of our life that we have left? Are we going to squander it? Or are we going to make it count for something? To the glory of the Lord. That when that eulogy is being read, and boy, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And when that eulogy is read, people will have so many things to say about who you were. Not what you did, who you were for Christ. That is what we should strive to attain. That's prayer. Father, we thank you that for every area of our lives, your word just has so many commands and explanations and details for us to follow that are so clear if only we would listen, if only we would obey, if only our hearts would desire to truly follow you. And I pray, Lord, that we would make a difference. I pray, Lord, that no matter what the age of those of us that are surrounded here together today, that we would take an account of our life and the time that is left remaining for us to make it worthwhile to count for you. Lord, help us to deny ourselves. Help us to take up our cross daily. And above all, Lord, help us to follow you. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for your blessing in our lives. Lord, I pray once again for those who are suffering right now, even today. Touch their bodies, I pray, Lord. Give them relief that they would be able to join us in fellowship soon. We thank you for your love, your compassion, your mercy, and your grace this past year. And we ask you for your love once again, your Holy Spirit that resides in us, comforting us, strengthening us, instructing us in 2024. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.